Berlin, 1936, the 11th Summer Olympic Games. The grandson of Virginia slaves, John Woodruff, is about to run in his first Olympics, and he's going to make the most daring move ever seen in the history of track. Runners from Canada, Italy, England, and Australia are lined up against him and planning to block him. In the final lap, they surround him. They won't let him pass. Then John makes a move that causes the entire stadium to gasp. He comes to a complete stop. With the runners in total confusion, John dashes around in the third lane and becomes the first 800-meter gold medalist for the United States in 24 years. These are the stories of forgotten pioneers, brave African men and women who faced the barriers of prejudice to make their place in sports. These pioneers changed the face of American sports forever. They accomplished the nearly impossible by rising above deep-seated racism with dignity and perseverance. We'll see dozens of forgotten stories that span some 200 years it will bring understanding to all Americans, young, old, black, and white. Standing out in the sun and the rain Because they believe They, believe they could achieve their dreams Because they believe Eighteen oh five, London. An African American was about to become the very first athlete of international fame. At that time in America, boxing was only a small, unorganized sport. So Bill Richmond went to England for a future in boxing, and he boxed his way to the top. Eighteen sixty five. The end of the Civil War and the end of 246 years of the horrors of slavery. The newly freed African Americans were about to embark on the most extraordinary achievements in human history. My great grandmother um, actually was a slave, and uh, her, her brother uh, went off and uh, during the Civil War. He was killed in the Civil War. And at that time, um, the, the next of kin in the Civil War got, got some, a sum of money, you know, for uh, bereavement. And, and my, uh, my great-grandmother used that money along with other money that she had scrimped and saved to buy uh, 10 acres of land. With poverty and illiteracy holding them back, they knew their hopes and dreams depended on education. So they began the impossible, to educate themselves and build solid, enduring communities. With this same determination and dignity, African-American athletes carried on through the decades in the face of incredible barriers and obstacles. Eighteen seventy five, the very first run for the roses, the Kentucky Derby. It was won by a horse named Aristides, ridden by a black jockey, Oliver Lewis. In fact, nine out of ten jockeys were black, a statistic that would soon end with the banishment of black jockeys. 1862. The first game of football was played in the United States. The first football teams were at select northern colleges. These colleges had a few African-American students, students that also wanted to play the new game. The decades that followed were fraught with prejudice and banishment. Whites did not want blacks playing football. In 1946, Marion Motley and Bill Willis were the trailblazers to first challenge pro football's race barriers. 
While playing football at the University of Nevada at Reno, opposing players and fans were outraged to see an African American on the field. Opposing players would aggressively step on Motley's hand with their spikes while calling him names. Motley said, my hands were always bloody. The refs looked the other way, but I just didn't let it get to me. Opponents stuck fingers in his eyes and punched him while he was lying on the ground. Dusty Baker relates his own experience while playing football in high school. So you're down on the pile and you get kicked or you get bitten or you get called all kind of names. And the word kind of got around that you could get to me by my temper. So my dad told me one more time, boy, and I'm through with it. And I was like, okay, Dad. Then a the guy called me something, sent this kid in. I went like this, and I put my hands down, and I was kicked out of the game. And the first person I looked up in the stands was my dad. And he just shook his head like this, and I was like, oh, man, here we go again. And Dad told me that, you know, we as a, as a people, we can't act like that necessarily because it would be more under control, you know, with more class and more dignity and twice as good to, you know, accomplish the same thing. So. R.C. Owens, having grown up in California, tells his experience of his first trip to the South as a teenager. And I remember visiting my, my uh, great-grandmother in the you know, first time in the South. And I remember getting on the bus with my great-aunt, and I sat down immediately because there was a seat open. And she turned around and she came up and she collared me and said, come with me. She told me, you sit uh, behind you know, toward the back. And I said, well, it didn't make any sense. There were seats open, you know, but she said, but that's the way it was. The Negro Leaguers have hundreds of remarkable stories of days spent crisscrossing the country. Out of those 28 days, we were away from home. We was in bed four hours. All the rest of the time, we slept in the bus traveling. So when it got two o'clock in the morning, I took over the wheel of the bus. Next morning, 7 o'clock, we got in Indianapolis, Indiana. We got in Tyler, Texas, 7 o'clock that night. We went in the bus to get our uniforms to go in the, go in the dressing room. This old guy holler, you can't dress in this dressing room. No naked dress in here. We had to go under the stands to dress. Try too hard to be somebody different, but don't you know that's just someone I'll never be? Yeah. We are now in a struggle for power. We're still struggling to get access to head coaching jobs. Uh, we have 119 Division I collegiate football schools, but we have six black head coaches, and we are still struggling for administrative jobs in uh, many sports.